All right, everyone on the call, I do appreciate your time and your effort being here. We know that your time is valuable and we look forward to spending about an hour and a half with you today to talk to you about what the spec, which is our two, the second half of our two-part series, which is finished product specifications. And with that, um, we are, I'm Larissa with United Natural Products Alliance, and we have five subject matter experts here with us today. We're going to have them cover one specific element of a specification and give that to you in detail. So we have a lot of people on the call that are outside of the UNPA membership. So I just wanted to take a, member, a minute to um, explain who is United Natural Products Alliance. And we are a trade association that is servicing the dietary supplement and natural products industry. We have a membership of about 120 vetted um, companies that represent brands, contract manufacturers, manufacturers, raw material suppliers, and service providers in the industry. So we do encourage you to look at the UMPA membership at umpa.com and to seek out those services if you need any help or assistance, especially some of our um, subject matter experts that are with us today. I have an unofficial tagline for United Natural Products Alliance, and I say that it's the greatest collection of brilliant minds, and we're all working forward towards the greater good. So this is um, one of those educational series for us that really we hope will um, help share information with the industry to make the industry um, a better place and hopefully to help you through some of those regulatory challenges that we continue to have um, with the FDA. So I'm gonna talk about um, setting the stage today and also sharing with you some information regarding um, what, why specifications matter. And then after that, we're gonna go through and we're gonna talk about, um, or I'm gonna pass it off to the subject matter experts. So I'm only gonna to talk to you for a short little a moment of time, and then we're going to move to um, the, the experts. So first um, slide that I have up that I think is really important, and I don't wanna insult anyone that's in the, um, the room, but finding the um, regulation itself, I think is super important. So I'm sharing with you my favorite um, part of the regulation or a link to the regulation. We can give you this long um, link that's shown at the bottom, or what I think is the, the easiest and most convenient is just Google it. If you search for 21 CFR part 111, you're gonna find a lot of options for links, but if you find the accessdata.fda, I find that to be the most helpful. It's gonna have um, what you see here on the right-hand side of the screen, which is a active links to each of those sections of the rule itself. And you can click in through those to see each of the sections themselves. It's kind of a boring read, but it's not a difficult read. If you have time and if you're in the quality or regulatory um, space or in those positions, I do encourage you to spend some time here. The reason I also show this to you is if you're experiencing a regulatory audit or inspection from an FDA auditor or um, investigator, you're going to want to make sure that you understand what's being said in each of these sections because you might have to have a um, discussion with them to make sure that you're both interpreting the regulation the same. So 11170 I think is super important because this is where you're going to find the information related to what specifications you must establish. So I put written here in italics. That's not stated um, in the regulation until you get to the record section. However, I think it's important that everyone highlights and understands written is super important because oral tradition doesn't count. And when they talk about a specifications during, a, um, in, during an inspection, they really act, they want you to hand them a document and they wanna see the five elements that we're gonna discuss today. And if those five elements are missing, you'll probably see a citation or a deficiency on a 483 that you have um, not incorporated the, the information. It's gonna show that it's um, failure to establish a specification. So here on 11170 is the actual text. I've cut and pasted it. This is kind of the overarching um, citation that investigators use at times. And it says you must establish a specification for any point, step or stage in the manufacturing process where control is necessary to ensure the quality of a dietary supplement and that the dietary supplement is packaged labeled as specified in the master manufacturing record. Now that's a pretty short statement, but what's important to notice here is I've placed a circle around, um, you must ensure the quality of a dietary supplement. So if we um, look at the definition for quality, it brings us to 111.3. 
which is the definition section. And here's the definition of, a, of quality within the regulation for um, the dietary supplement good manufacturing practice. Quality means that a dietary supplement consistently meets the established specifications for identity, purity, strength, and composition, and the limits of contaminants, and has been manufactured, packaged, labeled, and held under conditions to prevent adulteration under section 402A1, A2, A3, A4 of the Act. So this is bringing it back to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. But you'll notice how the specification section under um, the GMPs also kind of goes, it's circular, it goes down and it also pulls in these five elements of identity, purity, strength, composition, which are required on your um, spec sheets. So here is um, just expanding um, and bulleting a little bit more information on specs. If we take all that text and we kind of pull one, um, 11170 and just itemize what do you need a specification for, you must have specifications for components and ingredients, in-process material, labels, and finished product. I've used different colors on this slide to show that we the asterisk references back to our part one of the series, which was what the spec part one, um, which was specifications for ingredients. Um, so I encourage you, if you haven't seen that already, to, to seek out the recording. Um, it was distributed during the process of promotion of this event, but you can um, ask Cura at um, UNPA and she can get that for you as well. We're gonna focus today on finished products. So that one is shown here in red. And when we talk about 11170, again, we're looking at the requirements of the focus here is a, the regulatory requirements of the specification, specifically the finished product spec. And I call it the big five. This is my terminology. I, I pulled it out of the air at one point, but five pieces of um, information that the FDA investigator is looking at and looking for when they review a specification sheet are shown here identity, purity, strength, composition, and limits for potential contaminants. And remember the slide I just showed you on the definition of quality, that is being pulled directly from there. The two bullets also show you that at any point, step or stage in manufacturing where it requires control, you're also gonna have that identified as well as packaging. So we're seeing an increase in um, FDA citations or deficiencies on a 483 related to packaging. But these five elements are what we'll focus on today. So 11170E um, is going to bring us back to our finished product specs. And in E, this is the language, it's a very short paragraph, but it says for each dietary supplement that you manufacture, you must establish product specs for the identity, purity, strength, and composition of the finished batch of the dietary supplement and for the limits of those types of contaminations that may adulterate or may lead to the adulteration of the finished batch of the dietary supplement to ensure the quality of the dietary supplement. So this language is very similar to what we saw in A on the previous slide, where that was kind of the overarching. This one is specific to the finished goods. Today's presentations are going to really help you to understand what is the difference between a spec sheet for the raw and the finished, because you'll be evaluating them very differently. If we put it into bullets, you must establish product specs for identity, purity, strength, and composition of the finished batch and the limits for those types of contaminants that may adulterate, and you have to ensure the quality of the dietary supplement. And again, remember, I wanted to call your attention to that definition of quality. So what we're really trying to address here is what is in the bottle. And when we look at the supplement facts deck, as a former investigator, we would look at the um, product and evaluate, how do we know that that supplement facts deck is accurate? And I wanna know for this deck that I've shown here is not only are all the ingredients, um, the identity that we had um, determined was important for this formulation, which was covered in our part one, but I also wanna know, how do we know the amount per serving is accurate? So there's going to be a lot of calculation on the investigator's part. It's going to be the same calculations conducted by your formulators, but we want to make sure that when you create this formulation in the on the bench or on in paper, when you're talking about your dosages, that it's the same product that you have in the finished product bottle. So here on the first line for vitamin A, we're also going to look to see, is it the form and the source that you've stated? Is it, does this product actually have the 50% beta carotene that it states as vitamin A? 
Um, we're going to be looking at all of those details, so we'll walk through that. Why is it important? It's important to an FDA investigator and to the, the consumer because um, FDA is using, these are the top 10 deficiencies that the FDA finds when they're looking at a dietary supplement investigation. At the top is 11170E, and it has been since 2009. So that means we have failed to improve how to write a specification since the beginning of time when we're talking about regulatory time for dietary supplements. That when they, that's when they started recording this. So what you'll see on a um, 43 or maybe in a warning letter is that you have failure to, and you'll see the same citation is shown here. They're just gonna reword it by adding that failure to. So failure to establish product specifications for the identity purity strength composition of the finished batch. And all of that language is going to, going to be the same. They're just going to reword the front end of the sentence. So as an investigator, what am I looking at? Again, we're going to look at the supplement facts panel. We're going to look at all the manufacturing documents to make sure that you truly do have the product ingredients in the, in the bottle by looking through those manufacturing records and then tracing it all the way back through our testing documents and our monitoring records. So as a former investigator, I was always asking, show me, and then I want you to prove it to me. So I want the documentation to support everything you have on that panel. So here I have another example of a probiotic, which is obviously much more difficult to work through because- Something went wrong. Please so, try again. Sorry about that. Um, we have um, identifying all of those different probiotics in that bottle, identifying the amount of ingredients. This one shows it's 20 billion CFUs. A simpler version would be over there on the um, ginkgo biloba where we're looking at ginkgo biloba leaf. We're gonna verify those. We're gonna look at the standardized um, extract having 24% ginkgo flavonoid, flavone glycosides. And we're gonna, this supplement facts has also called out the amount of the um, glycosides at 28 milligrams. So I'm gonna verify as a former investigator, I would have verified each and every statement on that supplement facts panel. My soapbox is purity. Purity has always been misunderstood in the industry and but with some of our labs um, and consultants I see often using this inc incorrectly as well. Purity is the most misunderstood and um, it is not referring to microbiology, heavy metals or other contaminants. Purity is a measurement of the concentration of those individual ingredients or the markers that you might find in those. So almost to the end of my slides, investigators are going to look for, when we're looking at purity, identity, purity, and strength, we're going to look at product labels, certificates of analysis, we're going to look at specifications, and then we're going to trace it all back to testing and monitoring records. You should not be releasing based on a certificate of analysis. You have to have verification that that information is accurate from your supplier. I'm also going to trace it back through the formula to make sure all those um, amounts are accurate when we do calculation, and then I'm going to um, work backwards into my the testing and monitoring records. Composition is the intended mix of the components. And as an investigator, I'm gonna look at similar documents, but now I'm gonna pull in my manufacturing records. I'm gonna look at the formula, the master, the, uh, master manufacturing records and the batch records, and I'm gonna compare all of that to the label to make sure that that is consistent throughout. Finally, you have 11175, and this is where you're gonna verify your identity purity strength composition through testing and monitoring. If you have an expiration date on your products, you will be asked to support that with um, scientific data. So you'll have stability um, as well. This is done typically through chemistry. Some of this can be done using um, other methods, but most often you're gonna be looking at chemistry and analysis. And you'll probably need to incorporate some of the laboratories that are in our UNPA service membership or um, outside in, in the industry. But these are the ones that we have within the membership that I would highly recommend, and many of them are here today as speakers. So with that, I thank you for your time. I'm going to pass it over to all of our um, subject matter experts. We're going to go in the order of the um, regulation, so identity, purity, strength, composition, and limits for contaminants, and Elon is going to speak first from Alchemist, and he'll pass it off to Kit Goldberg for purity. Jason will speak um, third as um, Eurofins, Strength, and Katie representing a dietary supplement brand for composition, and then to James with Flora Research Labs. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to you, Thank, Thank you, sir. Melissa. Appreciate that. I'm going to share my screen. Someone please confirm you are seeing my Prezi. You are good. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Larissa. Um, 
everyone, my name is Alon Sudbrick, back here to talk about what the spec this time finished products. I am grateful for your attention today. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also grateful for the UNPA team for putting on these four really wonderful webinars. I'll try to go fast through the first parts and I have some case studies at the end. A little comedy, hope I can just pretend to hear your laughing. Um, talking today on having a finished product identities uh, crisis. Um, I love this next title, put away your testing by input calculator and lay off that fairy dust. Okay, so. Looking forward. Okay, so as I did before, some disclosures. For those of you who don't know me, you might know me from these exciting, awesome things. Crushing Hoodia with a single light microscope. Adultery of Hoodia, I just add. Uh, starting the first cannabis committee. You're welcome, I think. Uh, arguing for fit for purpose methods when the tricorders showed up and also leading the efforts for consumer access to next generation transparency in lab testing. Huge platform I'm working on these days. Very quick history in Alchemist. We were born in 1997 as a tincture manufacturer who was testing their own internal uh, ingredients, uh, or uh, failed some material and tested it again, failed more, tested it again, and became a lab by accident. Uh, many of these fine companies started in garages. We started in a colonic irrigation room and had good plumbing. Go, go, go figure. Uh, back then, uh, it was not clear what to test, when to test it, why to test it, uh, but something woke up the FDA, which was a adulteration of Clontago lanceolata with Digitalis lanata. Uh, one worked the gut, the other one worked the heart. People were hospitalized. It was a very serious encounter, and trust was eroded. Fortunately, FDA assembled a pharmacognitive stream team, uh, Stan Chikowicz, George Ziobro, Bill Overmeyer, and our very own Joe Betts, who's still active in the industry. We had lots of time uh, before the GMPs actually came out, about 10 years in fact, and we survived that uh, drought of quality. <laughs> uh, we worked with APA and uh, to get on basically every committee possible and then worked with uh, American Herbal Pharmacopeia to collect monographs and work with them on their monographs. We also spent a lot of time collecting reference materials, which is critical to any botanical testing laboratory. We house those in an internal herbarium with almost 20,000 specimens from almost 2,000 species. With those specimens, we compare against yours by making tiny little extracts and have those ready for you. Uh, so when you send in your burdock or lemon grass or whatever it might be, we're ready to test those materials. We do this all in a nice new facility. It's about three years old now, still feels new to me. And that now space is hugely populated by lots of equipment and people. Uh, who are mostly happy. So that's Alchemist Labs, just blowing through that so we can save time here. Um, as I mentioned last time we spoke, I talked about uh, what the spec uh, and in an identity crisis. Um, but now here we are still having one, but this time it is for a finished product identity crisis. And you might recognize these three farmers. My story then was about how three farmers harvested ginkgo seeds to then plant in their prospective, uh, respective lands. Uh, and with those seeds from the same plant, same genetics, they went to their uh, farms and grew them and used various variables that changed the outcome of the product, uh, whether it would be where it was grown, how it was harvested or watering, whatnot. Um, the point was that lots of little variables can change the final product and having a ingredient spec was really critical. So you can extract it 16 ways to Sunday. Here we are talking now about finished products, which as we all know, gets very complicated very quickly. Um, so that's what I'll be speaking on today. Now, fortunately, as Larissa mentioned, the GMPs were a gift to us, uh, the industry by the FDA. Um, they basically said, use some science, best of luck. We hope you don't see you in court. They don't really specify what test methods to use for what technologies. But what they also did is gave us specs or, or rules about specs. A finished product identity specifications are a critical GMP requirement. It is the law. No question about that. And here is the law. I'm going to read every single word. I'm just kidding. So this is a law, as Larissa shared, it is available online, but most importantly is brands need to formulate so that retail, retailers, regulators, and outside parties can confirm what's on the label is in the bottle. What a concept. So here I am going to read this next part. So for every each dietary supplement that you manufacture, you must establish product specifications for identity, purity, strength, and composition of the finished batch of the dietary supplement and for limits on those types of contaminations that may be adulterants or may lead to adulteration of the finished batch of the dietary supplement to ensure quality of the dietary supplement. I mean, it's clearly written here that you have to create these specs for your finished product. Now I've identified some obstacles, uh, major obstacles for you, and I'll go into those in great detail and I will close up with a uh, short case study and I hope um, it's not too complicated. I think it'll be straightforward. So major obstacles to finished product identity testing labels like this. So I'm not trying to disparage any of the really wonderful superfood products out there, uh, but we've all seen labels like this. I mean, look at all of these ingredients. 
um, and they're all extracts. So remember, if we go back to my initial presentation last time, the, the more you change the product, the harder it is to test. So if it was just grapeseed powder, that'd be one thing, but grapeseed extract 120 to one standardized to a 95% OPC, that's not really grapeseed. That's basically a chemical from grapeseed. Um, testing these products can be very, very complicated, which unfortunately leads to a lot of uh, sort of downstream problematic uh, issues here. Um, another issue is this little guy. I think he's probably the cutest and also ugliest fairy I've ever seen. I found him on the internet, thanks to the internet. Uh, fairy dusting, uh, fairy dusting, also known as angel dusting, which I didn't know that was equivalent uh, in my neighborhood in Long Beach, that's a different phrase. But anyways, uh, it's when an active ingredient is added to product to a product at a low level, just so the company can use it in its marketing claims. Now, I think you've all heard me say, I am a marketing guy with a chemistry degree, so I get it. I understand the marketing aspect here, but it's kind of cart before the horse because if you can't test uh, for quality products because your marketing team wanted you to throw in that extra ingredient, you're going to have problems. And so, uh, you know, working with your marketing department and the formulation folks and the lab is a really great idea. Another obstacle are tricorders. Now, Jim, I recall um, when you used the, a slide just like this, talking about the various tricorders that enter our industry, whether it be, uh, you know, a poorly used DNA technology or um, cell phone light boxes to identify and or qualify material in the cannabis industry gets crazy. You can throw a bud on a little thing and it'll quantify your THC in, in it without actually quantifying your THC. Uh, it's bizarre. And because of these uh, tricorder-like um, not time-tested, not validated, uh, not generally approved uh, instruments, a lot of poor quality material gets in. So let's say you have a finished product with all these ingredients and you're using a, a garbage uh, analysis to bring them into your product. Well, it's just gonna go downstream and cause problems uh, with the final products. You wanna be able to test the ingredients in your finished products. If you're starting with garbage because you're using a tricorder to let it in, you're never gonna be able to be successful there. And then I have a riddle for you. And this one, if anyone wants to, they can try to participate in the chat. Uh, so riddle me this, what has lots of buttons and won't help you catch adulteration in manufacturing? So I don't know if anyone has time or is quick on the keyboard, but what has lots of buttons and won't help you catch adulteration in manufacturing? I'll give you five seconds. I don't see any chats coming up. All right, that's a quick five seconds. I'm gonna go for it. Oh, a calculator, Jason, you know my spiel. <laughs> So perfect, a calculator, exactly. So I'm talking about testing by input, a calculator. Now the TI-89 put me through college, literally this, this calculator was amazing. I love this calculator, it helped me so much. And Joe, good job, calculator. But a calculator will not stop adulteration. And I get that testing by input is one, legal, and two, sometimes necessary, but it's really a function of the product that has been formulated and why are we leaving it to testing by input? Now, that's a valid reason to do it, but sometimes that could be avoided. Now, guess what? It is illegal. 21 CFR Part 111.75 D1 states that you may exempt one or more product specifications for, from verification requirements in paragraph C1 of this section. Basically, it states here in many, many words that if, you, if the product, um, there's no scientifically valid method for testing or examining such exempted product specifications at finished batch stage, you basically can resort to of uh, um, testing by input, which is basically looking at the batch records. Um, I don't think any consumer would be very pleased uh, to find out that this is happening. And in our experience as a testing lab, we see that happening more than it should. It's called appeal to ignorance, one of my least favorite uh, logical fallacies where you say, oh, there's no method in the USP or AOAC, I guess we can't test it, better take out that TI-89. TI-89s do not stop adulteration from happening. So those are some major obstacles. Now, of course, I'm gonna go into HBTLC. Um, so here is a very quick crash course on HBTLC, uh, and I'm gonna, after this, I'm going to go into a quick demonstration of how we deployed that for a very complicated finished product. So this is a short film on HBTLC. I'm going to narrate because there's no audio here. You'll see here one of our texts grabbing reference materials from our herbarium. You have to compare apples to apples. You can't just test an apple without another apple. So here are, here's our big collection of apples. Here's our wonderful uh, ladies of the TLC department. They run the show, CM and Con. Uh, they're prepping samples here. You can see we're basically making a tea. Uh, with an extract and solvent, uh, it's just simple as that. From that, we spot that on a TLC plate or an HBTLC plate with this really cool equipment that puts a little lanes at the bottom or bands at the bottom. We're now submerging that plate in a mobile phase, which draws the chemicals up the plate. You can see separation happening right there. There are a number of other tricks uh, that we do here to get better separation and development here after derivatization. It's heated and you can see the plate developing. 
And from that, we then decide, determine whether it uh, conforms or does not conform. That is basically HPTLC in, I don't know, 20 seconds. You're welcome. So here is a quick case study. Now, I know this is hard to see, but basically the goal of this analysis was to detect the presence and clearly distinguish an elderberry ingredient in a fruit gummy by HPTLC. You have here um, the ingredients of this product, uh, the gummy in the finished good, the placebo without the actual elderberry, raw ingredient of elderberry that they started with, and all the other stuff that goes into a gummy, uh, including melatonin in this case. Um, and I can go into this great detail later if someone has more questions, but I want to save time for the other speaker. So here's the first raw material qualification. Basically, what you're seeing here is in lane one, a reference standard from uh, elderberry. In lane two, we have Sambuca's Nigra flower, which should not be in there. It should be berry. Uh, then we have in lane three and four, uh, the actual um, uh, uh, reference material for Sambuca's Nigra. And then here's the key. I want you to pay attention to lane five and six. This is the actual raw ingredient of elderberry that went into this finished product. And I'll give you a quick hint. You can already see it's not looking so good. It's pretty barren. We should see more because you look at lane four, which is a reference material, it should look more like that. So there, bingo, right there from the starting point, we saw there's some problems. And if you go to lane seven through uh, uh, 10, seven through 10, you see this is actually the product without elderberry. So it's a placebo product. And then you see the product in lanes uh, 11 through uh, 14 here with the elderberry. And then over here on the right side, uh, lanes 15 are different species of elderberry. You can see various differences between those. So again, I know this is hard to, to understand, but what we're looking at here is the purpose of this analysis basically to analyze the raw material, finished goods and placebos next to each other, uh, including related species. Uh, the experiment conditions were adapted to the finished good in phase two. So here is phase two. Now this is where we basically took side by side of the ingredients. Um, you've all heard of influencers uh, on the internet, but here are the influencers on this chromatogram. So basically you see influencer number one, elderberry dry extract from USP. Hey, look at that. Uh, and then here's the actual raw ingredient in lane two of the actual elderberry. So it's looking pretty faint already. Uh, as I mentioned, if you start with ingredients that are not so great, you'll never see them in the finished product. Then you see some other influencers like sugar in lane three should, shows up as a band there. Lane four is corn syrup. Not much going on here until you see lane 11, which is the color fruit magenta, which is clearly an influencer in the plate. And then a masking agent, which is not looking so masky. And then melatonin is this big blob right here. And this is the same experiment, just two different detections. So we looked at this to basically isolate the ingredients to see what they look like on their own. And now finally here in this experiment, we show what they all look like as we put them back together. So basically we reconstructed the ingredients the finished good ingredient. So here is lane one, an elderberry USP extract. Then that finished product, I'm sorry, the, the raw elderberry extract that was supposed to be in the ingredient. And we added the sugar, no impact, no impact, no impact, all the way through corn syrup starts to, at uh, least lane five, ascorbic acid here. You can see brightens the plate. So I actually have some input. And then lane 11 is where that colored fruit magenta. And then you can see where the, the um, melatonin shows up and produces its big blob. The idea was to basically show that we can see the elderberry in this product, and we did, and we were able to, and it was very faint. Um, and when this was a successful um, deconstruction and reconstruction of a finished product, basically ultimately showing that yes, we could see the elderberry in this product. It was not super complicated. Now, if you looked at that super fruit, super product, um, food product earlier, that would have been much more difficult. We do blend analysis by HPTLC all the time. If it's just a simple ingredients, like a bunch of um, uh, plants together, it's much easier. Uh, when you start adding all the other uh, ingredients, it gets more complicated. The point is, it is possible. Stop the appeal to ignorance, a fallacy, and try looking to uh, identify the finished products or the ingredients in the finished products. And I'm going to close up here with some solutions uh, as I see them. So here's one. If your R&D lab is going to create something it can't control, like an unstable formula or maybe a deadly virus, you might want to make sure it stays in the lab. Hope you all got that joke. Also avoid tricorders that perpetuate poor quality ingredients, garbage in, garbage out. If you're starting with poor ingredients, you're never gonna see them in the finished product once you mix them all together. Uh, avoid formulating below therapeutic uh, doses. Obviously marketing is really important, but keep them out of the formulation process. Uh, fairy dusting is no help to the industry and, act, and actually it's a detriment to the industry. And lastly, testing by input will not stop adulteration. And just imagine if the consumers realize that that's one legal and two happening that we actually didn't test what's actually in your product. And the fact is you can, if you simplify your ingredients and use the correct testing methods. Thank you for your attention and your time. If you have any questions, I'm on the internet, alon at alchemist.com. You can't miss me uh, on LinkedIn. And again, thank you so much, uh, Larissa and UNPA team and good luck uh, 
to the next speaker. I will now stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you, Lana. Now we're going to change over to Kit, who's going to talk to us about the next topic, purity. Right, which I hope I'm trying to share my screen. Um, you got this. Kit, you okay. are to share screen. It looks like you're good to go. Okay. Um, so I'm talking about the purity specification or not. You are frozen. Started sharing screen. Maybe start, um, go back and, and end your screen sharing and then try it once more and see if that gives you anything. It's frozen. Completely frozen. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get out and log in again. She can't get in. Don't go out. Kit, don't go out. Yes, you can. She can't get All right. in. Um, well, let's. She's frozen. Yeah, she's frozen. So, um, Jason, would you mind if we pulled you in as the next speaker and when we get Kit settled again, we can. Why yeah, don't no, you. No problem at all. What do you think, Kit? Are you? Uh, okay, let's see. Let me try sharing one more time. Okay. There you see the screen? Yes, ma'am. I'm just switching Perfect. to presenter mode and you're on your way. Presenter mode, huh? All right. Um, go to slideshow and then yep. start from beginning. Uh, Far left side. It does not want to do this. Um, okay. Go. Technical difficulties aside, I'm talking about uh, purity in finished products, which is very different from the purity in the ingredients that we talked about last time. I'm going to just take a few minutes uh, on USP standards, the requirements and definitions, and then I'm going to give some examples of the different kinds of uh, ways you would meet purity for the different types of dietary supplement products. So USP is in the business of setting standards for quality. We have standards that are published in the USPNF for drugs, dietary supplements, um, biologics. We also have the Dietary Supplement Compendium, which contains all of the monographs and related information for dietary supplement ingredients and some products, as well as information about admissions, which is safety evaluation. We also have the Herbal Medicines Compendium, for herbal medicines that are not medicines in the US, but that are some other parts of the world. We also have the Food Chemical Codex. One of the most important things we have is the Pharmacopeal Forum. We publish proposed standards in the Pharmacopeal Forum. It's open for comment for 90 days, and we very much want to hear specific comments about the standards from industry. And we also sell the associated reference standards. The USP documentary or written standards come in three flavors. The foundation are the general notices and requirements. Then there are general chapters, which relate to more than one monograph or may relate to specific topics. And then there are the monographs themselves. And the monographs contain specifications. So if you are looking for specifications, this is a great place to start. What is in those specifications? They are the official validated tests and the methods for those tests, <clears throat> as well as the actual acceptance criteria. And those together create <clears throat> specifications for identity that Elon just talked about, purity and limits for contaminants, 
content, which in the finished product is strength or composition, as well as the quality or other performance requirements that are used for finished products. And those are consistent with the FDA CGMPs for dietary supplements. So you've heard a lot already about the requirements for the specifications. And we talked last time about the requirements and meeting the specifications for the purity of dietary ingredients. And really, if the purity of the dietary ingredient has been correctly established and you have that specification, then it's fairly straightforward for the finished product to have identified what the purity is. What does purity actually mean? For drugs, it's defined as relative freedom from extraneous matter in finished product, whether or not harmful to the recipient or deleterious to the product. Purity includes, but is not limited to relative freedom from residual moisture or other volatile substances and pyrogenic substances. There is no equivalent definition for dietary supplements, although that is not a bad definition. In the general chapter 2750, USP defined identity as the ident a purity as the identity and amount of the substance that is the intended substance. So the intended substance not being the fairy dust that Elon was talking about, but what is really in there. And it's typically expressed in units of percentage and determined using the tests for assay or content. So the assumption is that you have used a pure dietary ingredient. And then when you move into content, you're basing your purity on the label claim. And depending on the product, you get the specification for information in the different tests. So it may be the assay or strength with a percent weight weight or amount per dosage form. It may be that you have part of the composition where you know what the rest of the ingredients are. You need to have your impurities controlled and quantified. And that already is part of the ingredient. But for the finished product, if there are degradation products, you need to know what those are and have a limit on those. Residual water and solvents need to be controlled. And for probiotics, your content or strength or purity is in the label claim. So I'm going to give you some examples of the difference between the ingredient and the finished product and what the finished product purity specification would look like. So for a probiotic product, this is a bacillus coagulans capsule that is a USP monograph. You have the ingredient and it is indicated that it may be blended with diluents or bulking agents, and it contains no less than 100% of the labeled viable cell count of Bacillus coagulans <clears throat> GBI 306086. So your capsules will then contain no less than 100% of the labeled viable cell count and your acceptance criteria is no less than 100%. So essentially your purity in that sense is ensuring that you have 100% of what you said you had in the capsule. If you're looking at a plant in, um, extract capsule or tablet, taking American ginseng root and rhizome dry extract as the ingredient, it's defined as having no less than 10% of the ginsenocytes on an anhydrous basis. And the content is no less than 90 and no more than 100% of the labeled amount. You may have suitable added substances. So this, again, your ingredient may not be 100% pure because it has added substances as carriers, but you know how much is in there because of the labeled amount. You know how much water is allowed. 
and you know there is a limit on the alcohol. So there is your ingredient. For your capsules product, you have the definition, again, containing no less than 90 and no more than 100% of the labeled amount with the calculation on the total ginsenicide. You are then measuring your content by the assay. And this may include other non-dietary ingredient components, it may include inactive ingredients, um, bulking agents, coding for the tablets, et cetera. But what you're claiming on is your 90 to 110% of your labeled claim. If you're looking at an individual ingredient, looking at purity, for example, in beta carotene, the ingredient definition, no less than 96 to 101% of total carotenoids calculated as beta carotene, and a limit of no less than 95% of all trans beta carotene, and a limit on your related compounds, alpha carotene. When you move to the capsule, because you already have the related compounds limit in the ingredient, you don't need to include it in the finished product, as long as your ingredient has called that out and met that specification. When you get to more complex in, um, mixtures, something like an oil-soluble vitamin tablet, you have the definitions for all of the individual ingredients and the information about what they may contain in addition. So for vitamin A, it may be diluted with edible oil or edible carriers. It may contain antimicrobial agents, dispersants, and antioxidants. When you put it into your tablet, all you are looking at is the label claim for the amount of vitamin A and all the other vitamins. But the point is you may already have additional ingredients in there in the ingredient that is not affecting the purity claim in the finished product. Purity in the finished product in this case, however, indicates it must not contain any other vitamins or minerals, and it may contain other added substances that are generally recognized as safe. And I would like to thank you for your attention. I will shop, stop sharing and hand this over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Kit. Great information on purity for finished good. We're going to pass this over to Jason with Eurofins, and he's going to help us walk through the strength and how to measure strength on our raw material, or excuse me, our finished goods. Okay, great. So thank you for that, Kit. How am I looking there? Can you yep, see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, Roger. just give me a moment to get back on camera. I lost that. Hold on, just a moment here. There we go. Okay. Hi everyone, Jason Mulligan here. I am uh, honored to be with you all again. So I am representing Eurofins. I lead our dietary supplement testing sales team. And I also uh, am over our botanicals and sports nutrition testing lab located in Brea, California. Since I have your attention, I, I want to um, share that we are hiring for a general manager for this site. So if you are interested or have someone you know uh, who's qualified, please reach out to me. Um, that would be awesome. So brief overview on Eurofence. So we are celebrating 35 years. Eurofins was founded as a startup of three people in a university in Nantes, France. Our original founder, Gilles Martin, is still our CEO. And now we're nearing a thousand labs globally and uh, operating in over 50 countries. Um, what's interesting about that from a dietary supplements perspective is we're starting to be able to operate and, and meet you uh, in the geographies where you're playing and where you're operating. So this is uh, increasingly coming into conversation with companies that are headquartered in India, have manufacturing throughout the US and are distributing throughout the world. So that's part of a project that uh, I'm involved in and is also in line with some of the work that Eurofins is doing with UNPA and Lauren and uh, the teams in China. 
So more on that um, if you're interested. Um, moving along here. So Eurofin's footprint real quickly. This is our uh, microbiology labs, just pretty, pretty uh, distributed presence throughout the US. And then we've got our dairy labs, our larger nutrition testing labs, primarily in Des Moines, Iowa, Madison, and Toronto, um, up in Canada. Our supplements testing labs uh, throughout North America, primarily in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and then in Brea in Orange County, um, as well as um, significant testing that we do down in our New Orleans lab. Um, getting right to it. So last time I spoke, I covered uh, raw materials for potency testing. So it's fairly straightforward, but there are some nuances that are important to pay attention to. For finished products, the title here really captures it, that strength does matter through the cycle. And what, what's important here is that the, the GMPs require testing in process because as many of you know, it's really easy to, to, to lose um, potency or strength and, and really affect the integrity of the product as you're going through X number of steps to go from raw dietary ingredient to your finished product on the shelf. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things to pay attention to to make sure that that doesn't happen for you. Just a quick refresher on what I think is a great definition of strength, which is the, the first word that, that I would associate to be synonymous with strength is concentration. And that's because it's a quantitative amount per a serving. So I just highlight here, very simple uh, math, but a vitamin B2, 100 milligrams, it's not the quantity of the ingredients, the quantity over the amount stated over a, a specific unit of measure. So in this case, it's one capsule, 100 milligrams um, per serving, and the serving is one capsule. So really easy, um, but sometimes even that is, is not really you know, well understood. Um, so just a quick definition refresher. On the actual regulations, I'm going to make it really simple, um, and, and Larissa kind of covered it, but for strength, you got to have a specification. And as we saw from the data, FDA is, is, this is the top, not strength, but lack of specifications or, or issues with specifications is one of the top citations. In addition to having a strength specification, you got to have it maintain strength through the shelf life of the product. So that's really important. And there was something that, that came up uh, in, in a lawn slide where the product had looked like 70 plus ingredients, when those ingredients are changed, which you know we, we all know many of the formulations change sometimes frequently, you also have to confirm that the, the potency claims or the strength claims still maintain through the shelf life of this now new formulated product. So that's also something that you know marketing might not always understand or get right, but from a quality perspective, that is absolutely in scope. And it's, um, it can be difficult to do, especially when you're talking you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 plus ingredients. The strength of the ingredient has to be 100% through the shelf life and that's specifically for class one. So I talked a little bit about this a couple of weeks ago and then I'll touch on it again because it's really simple, um, but it's worth knowing. So there, here are the two exceptions. One is the class two nutrient. So that's naturally occurring. And the rules of the game are that you have to maintain at least 80% of the declared value. Okay, and that's to allow for, you know, what variance from somewhat obvious issues, especially for botanicals. Uh, there's gonna be differences in um, where the plants are grown, how they're grown, temperature, all, all the factors. Um, so there's a little bit of leeway in there of uh, 80%. The second exception is what's attributable to the variation of the analytical method. So the method variation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about both of those two as we go. So here's a really clean, simple example. So on the left side, we have vitamin C, which is in a controlled way, uses ascorbic acid, 26 milligrams. So through the shelf life of this gummy product, the company needs to show, the brand needs to demonstrate that there's 26 milligrams of ascorbic acid through that shelf life. Not a non-controlled example would be from a natural source. So in this case, it's vitamin C. It doesn't specify here what it's from. If we look on the label, we can see there's rose hips, acerola, uh, cherry. So it's really unclear where it's coming from. But with that, they're only claiming six milligrams. So they would need to show 
80% of that or about 4.8 or so uh, through, actually exactly 4.8 through the, the shelf life of the product. Um, so that is the distinction between a class one and class two. Um, just wanna highlight that and make sure that that's as it's straightforward, uh, but make sure it's super clear. So as Larissa opened up with, the FDA has been and, and really is continuing to crack down on poor quality due to lack of specifications. Here's just a warning letter where it cites fa having failed to establish product specifications, in this case for purity and strength. And um, you know, th this is, I think the key takeaway from the what the spec webinar, and in this case for strength, is that it's a big focus for the FDA. There's you know many a high number of citations and warning letters going out. Um, so you know, for companies that are not quite getting it right, it's it's not you're not going to be able to have that. It's it's not this group. It's really you know it's awesome that you all are on here, but it's really you know the message is loud and clear that you got to dial it in and get the specifications right. I do want to talk about some of the factors that you know are not so obvious and can impact strength throughout the, the product life cycle for development and and really through the shelf life. So the first one is component degradation. So some factors there would be time. So duration, many of you know, vitamins degrade over time. There's light influence, but we'll just stick with time. You gotta know what the impacts are for the duration of it. That's why you're doing shelf life studies. The second would be temperature, which you know this last couple of years, uh, especially with the significant increase in sales through Amazon and the fulfillment center um, guidelines or, or really uh, whatever, what each of you were, were sort of told by Amazon, there's real factors to consider in terms of temperature and storage temperature. And then I have it there, storage conditions. So those are all things to be real hyper aware of and understand throughout um, not only the product development, but also distribution and, and sales. Um, Processing loss, so critical steps where control is necessary. Um, that's an important one as well. Um, there's a number of examples I have just from my experience running, running the labs is, you know, there, there are times where solution doesn't mix well. Uh, I think I have the yeah, sample homogeneity um, and, and it's not apparent. There's a lot of times it's through conversations with your lab or with the, the technical leadership that you have to get to why are things not um, processing in the most uniform way or how you intended it. Um, starting with, Alon touched on this a little bit, but if you have uh, ingredients that you haven't characterized, so starting point with raw dietary ingredients, you're going to have problems, of course, on the, on the, when you get to the finished product um, stage, if you're starting with bad quality or uncharacterized ingredients before they're put in. So that's an important one. Um, he, he used the term fairy dusting and angel dusting, and that's, that's right in scope. It's, if you're starting with uncharacterized ingredients, um, you're going to have problems with the finished product. Formulation and manufacturing errors happen. You know, this is where having excellent traceability and documentation is really important. So if the processing called for five kilograms of an ingredient to be added, and then you go back and you're having testing issues, the product's not testing out and you learn that it was actually only three kilograms was added, that traceability is really important. And you know, I think looking at it in these discrete steps helps to simplify in otherwise, some cases, very complex um, product development, as, as many of you could, could tell me in much greater detail. Um, and then the improper overage. So that's imp the main consideration there. There's many of them, but is to make sure that the overage you're putting in is gonna hold its integrity through the shelf life of the product. So it might make it you know, for uh, the first few lots of testing or even for a period of time, but you wanna make sure, you have to make sure that the overage um, meets label claim through the shelf life of the product. So that I'm sure that sounds simple, but it's, it's harder to do in some cases, depending on the ingredient that we're talking about. So these are factors that could lead to out of specifications that are agnostic or different, have nothing to do with lab issues. But I do wanna talk about what could be um, happening with the lab that you're working with. First would be method selection. So not using fit for purpose methods. We see this 
uh, all the time, especially with botanical potency. Um, an example that comes to mind is a recent case with a, a company testing, a manufacturer testing for ginsenicides, and they ordered a, met a, a ginsenicide method for um, ginseng, and it was meant for the actual raw ingredient. And they were testing what was a, effectively a hard chew, like a candy, and it was not, the method was not appropriate for that matrix. So that's something through a conversation and then some work for the lab to extend the method to make it appropriate for that and suitable for that particular matrix was really important. Um, so just something to be aware of. And that's where I'll, I'll emphasize this again later. I'm sure Alan and Jim would agree with me. Having a strong trust-based relationship with your lab is crucial to get these. There's so many variables that you have to hold and account for. Um, and it's, I don't know how you do it. If, if you're sending a lot of work out to a third party lab and you don't have this really strong relationship to have these conversations and get it right. Um, the second would be method variability, method uncertainty. What's important there is that, you know, you have that. So let's say you're trying to claim, or you're claiming hundred milligrams of an ingredient and the method has a 10% uncertainty. You want to avoid putting 90 milligrams in, right? You, so don't, test into it and, and say, you know, yeah, we're good. There's, there's method variability. That's not, you would be okay from an FDA perspective. I think Larissa can, can correct me on that. But the point is to have integrity in what you're claiming and not, not um, input the amount that's going to align to what the method variation is or method uncertainty. The complexity of the finished product, Alon touched on this, and it, it's really difficult. This segues right into interferences and getting the, um, the ability and specificity to determine, you know, what it is you're actually looking for. That's really hard to do. You know, some of, some of the innovations in, the, in this industry are, are incredible from a delivery format and visual perspective with, you know, mini tablets inside an oil-filled gel capsule. And it, it looks amazing, but you, this is again, coming back to having a really strong relationship with the lab. You and the lab need to know where each ingredient that you're seeking to test and that you're claiming actually is in that, you know, super innovative um, new delivery format. And it's not always apparent, especially when there's three, four, five different components in a single capsule. Um, okay, we'll continue on here. So if you joined me two weeks or so ago, I had this slide up and for the sake of time, I only got a minute and a half left. The, the highlight here is if you're the brand owner, you are ultimately responsible. So there is, you know, a, a lot from the ingredient supplier through the manufacturer that needs to be qualified and verified. But as the brand, you got to make sure that looking left in the supply chain, um, the manufacturer is established and verified in this case strength. But each of these specifications we're talking through today and that you qualify your ingredients throughout the processing um, of the final product. But again, highlight brand owner is responsible. Okay, wrapping up here. So I'll just briefly touch on this is that I'll, I'll say it again, highlighting a, having a really strong relationship with your lab. If you don't, if you work with Eurofins and you don't feel that that's true, please reach out to me. I, I love getting this right and finding ways to deliver more value and, and stronger um, communication and service to you. Um, I, I won't go through them because they're pretty, they're pretty straightforward, but you saw these last time if you joined us, and if not, you can go through them um, on your own. If you need support with specifications, uh, writing them, guidance on them, reach out to us. We have an entire team dedicated to who, who does this, um, and they're really good at it. If you want to follow up with me or with Eurofence, here's a really simple uh, URL you can go to when you get these, um, when you get these slides. Here's some points of contact you'll get as well. And uh, with that, I'll wrap up there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate you and your information. We are gonna pass it to Katie. Katie's joining us with um, Now Foods and she will talk to us about composition, specifically the composition for finished goods and why that matters. And Katie, we have your slides up. If you can switch it to presenter. You will be ready to go. All right, just give me one second. I'm just trying to put my camera on. <laughs> no worries. We um too many. Uh, too many options. Too many options. Yes. 
Um, thank you. All right, I got that. All right, thank you for your time. And then... All right, can you see my screen okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, center mode. If you want to switch to your di display settings on the upper left hand corner. And then you can, um, there you go. And if you switch swap, you'll see, we'll see your slides. There you go. You're ready All to right. go. A little bit of technology. All right. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here again. I'm Katie Bonashevsky. I'm representing Now Foods. Uh, we are a dietary supplement company specializing in manufacturing dietary supplements, sports nutrition, personal care items, and foods. Uh, in the last What the Spec, I covered the regulatory requirement for proper creation of specs when it comes to dietary ingredients. Uh, today, I will talk about the finished goods and the dietary supplement requirement when it comes to composition. Maybe not as exciting as, uh, as other topics, but uh, equally important. So let's begin with um, what is a dietary supplement spec. Uh, there are um, a defined set of parameters used to establish uh, the characteristics of quality of a finished product. And Larissa touched upon that uh, a little bit. We're focusing on, on the quality aspect of, of a finished good. Uh, and by defining those specifications, we are ensuring quality at the same time. So uh, manufacturers uh, are required to um, provide, uh, to create and provide the uh, finished uh, good specifications, but not only finished good. Uh, you need to provide specifications for raw materials and process uh, and finished products, as well as, as packaged products. Uh, so we need to be able to provide documentation that is linked at the end and provides traceability of uh, the whole process from sourcing, sourcing of the ingredients uh, through the manufacturing process to what are we stating on the label. So let's focus on the finished good specifications. If you're planning on making a claim for the supplement you are manufacturing. Every claim ingredient on the label uh, of the supplement facts panel uh, must be also listed on the finished product specification. And uh, it also has to have appropriate minimum test acceptance criterion uh, that meets each product specification for identity, purity, strength, composition, limit of potential contaminants. Uh, so overall, everything, maybe a little bit backwards, everything that we're stating on the supplement facts panel has to be traceable back to the specifications that we're creating for the finished good. When we're talking about dietary supplement composition, um, it simply refers to the multiple ingredients uh, in a dietary supplement. All the ingredients uh, present in a manufactured supplement must be designated by their common name uh, in a decreased order of predominance by weight. Ingredients that are not categorized as dietary uh, ingredients, such as binders, excipients, fillers, also must be included on the list. So when you think about this uh, requirement, it is pretty straightforward all ingredients need to be listed on the spec. Then the question is why so many companies are still cited by the FDA for not meeting this requirement. So I can guarantee about 50% of uh, those who listen to this webinar are gonna go back to their specs and they're gonna find something that's missing. How you may ask. So let's simplify this. If an ingredient, which is a part of a dietary supplement, consists of other active constituents, it must be listed on the spec. 
as an example, if you're using curcumin powder as an active ingredient, that curcumin powder may contain MCC and sunflower lecithin. Then the finished product, which you're making into a 500 milligram capsule, is manufactured with some rice flour, microcrystalline cellulose, magnesium stearate, and silicon dioxide. Then what does the finished good spec should contain? So we still have the curcumin, 500 milligram, which needs to be confirmed by testing, and uh, Jason talked about that. But other ingredients must be listed as rice flour, MCC, magnesium stearate, sunflower lecithin, and silicon dioxide. So all of the components that are part of the composition, part of the formula, need to be listed. There are some exceptions though. Some of the processing aids are not required to be listed on the label. But the only reason why they're not required to be listed on the label is when they are used in a very small amount. So for example, if you are manufacturing a product using an ingredient that has um, maltodextrin used as a processing agent, but at the end, that ingredient still contains about 7% of maltodextrin. That maltodextrin needs to end up on the specification in other ingredients and ultimately on the label. However, if you are, let's say, manufacturing a soft gel using um, a lubrication agent, some mineral oil, let's say, to make sure that the gelatin doesn't stick to the tooling, that lubricant is not part of the formulation and is may be present in the, in the end uh, finished good in a very small amount, there's no requirement to list that on the label. Other than that, everything that is part of the formulation needs to end up on the finished good specification and ultimately on the label. When you think about it, anything that Mm -hmm. alters or changes the composition, the final good, the composition of the final final product needs to end up on, on the label. Although uh, spec would be the preferred way to contain all the information for all the active ingredients and all the non-dietary components, uh, as long as sufficient documentation is kept and provided to the auditor, let's say, uh, that is still sufficient. So uh, for example, if um, we have a list of uh, non-dietary components uh, combined with the active ingredient uh, in the form of a master manufacturing uh, record or a master formula where uh, a detailed composition of the finished good is listed in a descending order and uh, it, it uh, shows the percentage used. Uh, and I have a reference uh, on the right here, uh, just a snapshot of a master uh, formula that is still traceable to all the ingredients that are being used in the formulation. And that link is extremely important when you think about the next step, uh, which would be uh, the label. All the information that is included on the spec should and needs to end up on the label. You need to be able to connect the ingredients spec from the dietary ingredient through the finished goods spec or the master manufacturing record or the master formula, which ultimately ends uh, on, on the label. I have posed the same question in my previous presentation, why it matters. Uh, why does it matter to have that link? Uh, well, first of all, it's the law. It's an FDA requirement to comply with the specifications uh, for the composition. But secondly, having good specification in addition to solid 
quality control program prevents the product adulteration and sets good expectations. So having all necessary information ensures the product quality, prevents mistakes during the manufacturing process, and prevents manufacturing uh, prevents miscommunications with uh, the manufacturers if you are using, let's say, contract manufacturing facility. Uh, it also helps when, when sourcing ingredients. It also helps when working with, with co-packers. So it removes uh, the level of, of um, confusion uh, if you have documentation that clearly defines what the expectations are and holds everyone accountable to those expectations, whether it's yourself as a manufacturer uh, or it's a, a co-manufacturer co or, or a co-packer. Co so in summary, I'm going to keep it short and sweet because this is a very straightforward topic. Uh, setting solid specifications will not only ensure your product quality and uh, ensure your credibility as a manufacturer, but it will also prevent you from receiving one of the specific one of the specification violations from the FDA. And uh, I think we've uh, emphasized the fact that manufacturers are still. Uh, receiving plenty of uh, citations when it comes to the failure to establish specifications for identity uh, of product components and ingredients and uh, failure to establish specifications for identity, strength, purity, and compositions, as well as limits of uh, potential contaminant that may adulterate the finished product. Very straightforward. Uh, and uh, I wanted to uh, thank you all for your attention and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Katie. We'll take questions at the end, but you can feel free to start dropping them into the chat window. You can address them to, um, to Katie or you can address them to Linda or you can address to everyone and we'll try to get to those as we move through. We are going to have our final speaker, which is James Kababic. He's with Flora Research Lab. He's going to talk us through contaminant monitoring of those finished goods. So go ahead, James, and share your screen. You are starting to share, so it looks like we are we are seeing your desktop. And now there you go. Are you seeing my title page now? You are all set to go. Thank you, sir. All right, very good. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining us. And I'm pleased to be here today. A uh, little quick note about our company. I, I started the lab in 1993, focused on essential oil authentication, which was rampant at the time. Uh, adulteration was huge. Uh, we expanded in the mid-90s to botanical microscopy and HTP TLC and uh, pioneered phytoforensic techniques for clandestine adulteration, counterfeiting, product failure. And we have some pretty advanced technology solutions here and our lab uh, prides ourselves on being an outside the box thinker. Uh, we like to solve those problems that uh, may be challenging to help you get to the bottom of things. I wanna help people understand how contamination can enter products during manufacturing, uh, where you need to look at clandestine adulteration and uh, how to make strategic choices in setting specs. We know from the last presentation, dietary ingredients are complex but finished products are even more complex because now you have all these ingredients mixed together. Uh, naturally sourced materials could be very inconsistent. There could be variable dosage forms. Uh, you have excipients, homogeneity, and often whole manufacturing. So things that can impact finished product quality, uh, it's gonna start with lot representative sampling because it's all downhill from there. I'm not reading this to you, but this is the code that talks about lot representative sampling, statistically valid, scientifically valid sampling plants. Um, I could probably close down more companies than not if I was FDA by just enforcing this rule. There's a big problem with powders and that is they stratify during shipment. And when you submit a sample to a lab like Eurofins, Alchemist, Flora, uh, the, the, the poll that you make has to represent the lot under test. 
And then in the lab, we have to make sure that what we test from that container you send us is representative of that sample. This is really critical. It's often undervalued and it can be huge. Uh, this is um, my uh, Latin binomials from too many Roadrunner cartoons, but the, the gist here is you get this stuff in large containers, totes, drums, you send a bag to a lab and a small aliquot is used for, for testing. But, uh, you know, is, is that slide mount or that uh, gram extracted for TLC representative of that container ship, that shipment that came in? Maybe not. Uh, there's times when you can do that and there's times when you can't. Uh, you all, of course, sleep with the USP under your bed uh, or under your pillow for nighttime reading. Uh, and uh, there's a beautiful illustration in 1097 of powder stratification in drums. You can see the region for scoop sampling. If you're scooping from the drum like this, you don't know what you've got. So you need to really, really, really look at your sampling here. This is a typical sample sent to our lab of powder we dumped out. And as you can see, if I just stuck a spatula in there and took some sample out, I could have data all over the place. What's representative here? So a lot of our efforts in the lab are, are on rehomogenizing samples and making sure we get good aliquots. It takes us about two hours to prepare a protein container for melamine contamination by using a USP uh, quarter compositing and division of the material. And uh, it, it is really a lot of work and it takes more time to prepare the sample for testing than the testing a lot of times. Uh, this sampling design is, is often marginalized. And if you don't have good sampling design, your data is useless. So, you know, you can't look at trace contaminants by taking multiple poles from the lot and blending them all together because you could have a hot spot and then, and, and then miss that hot spot because you've diluted it out and then end up with a contaminated finished product and get one of those bounty hunter love letters. But what, what kind of contaminants could be introduced during manufacturing? Uh, your raw materials may be clean, but that doesn't mean that your finished products are okay. A lot of people say, well, we test all our raw materials. We don't have to do any finished product testing because we have what Alon's favorite thing is, input records. But things can go wrong. Humans, despite best efforts, make mistakes. It doesn't have to be malicious. It could just be an error. Uh, facilities can have very strange things happen in them. I've investigated some freaky, freaky things. Um, in processed and finished product testing is very important to make sure lots meet specification. And when you're using a toll manufacturer, you have a little more vigilance that you have to do. My, microbial contamination and the production source can be a really big issue. And there's a variety of ways here that microbial contamination can enter, but we're gonna look at this site window crack right here. This is our case study. Uh, this company made a 1500 gallon batch of material, and then they would pump it into their holding tank for bottling. And depending on how much bottling they were doing, they'd pump the appropriate amount. And so they had one lot and then they had batches that they bottled, but only the bigger batches of bottling ended up with yeast contamination. And what we found on our on-site investigation was that the bulkhead around the site window was cracked and it was packed with yeast. And every time the liquid level got up there, it contaminated it. But if you did half of, of a container, it never hit the site glass. So they're scratching their heads going, look, we tested the lot. How come only some of the bottles are blowing up in the warehouse? And uh, this is the kind of weird stuff that we find. You can get a host of metal contamination sources. Uh, you can have spot contamination. You could have leaching from welds, uh, cleaning agents. I investigated a case where um, there was a, a procedure for wiping down with ACS grade uh, acetone. Uh, the, the person went to get the acetone, they were out, so he went to the janitor's closet and got some paint grade acetone and washed everything down and contaminated everything with heavy metals. Um, coolant can leak, containers can be contaminated. I've seen containers introduce lead into products, so there's a lot of things that can happen. Uh, capsule lubricants, hairs, fi uh, fibers, feathers, shell fragments, you can have vandalism. You can have adhesive from labels leaching through the containers. You can have what you thought were cellulose capsules that are porcine and contain lead. 
So when you get to toll manufacturing, you have a facility that's making products with your brand name on it. So they make it, it's got your name on it, so you're liable. But there's really good benefits to toll manufacturing. If you're making chewable gels, soft gels, capsule and capsule, it may not make sense for you to set up an operation to do that when somebody who's got the expertise can do it for you. And it's a better option for startups that don't have as much time or money to get things going out there. And a toll manufacturer can often make a better product for you. And I've known where toll manufacturers will make a bulk capsule run and then containerize them and then bottle them as you need them. So they can provide some holding and distribution functions sometimes. So there's good reasons that somebody might use a toll manufacturer. They could be a good partner. But the risk are you have no control over manufacturing, you're relying on their integrity, their mistakes are still your liability, and unethical players are known to substitute ingredients for lower cost alternatives. We've seen this with uh, uh, brand name botanical extracts that are well regarded. Everybody that specified that got a C of A showing that they bought that material, but they showed that same C of A to 10 companies and um, they bought the material once and bought stuff out of China the other nine times. So you got to be careful. Um, also, this is your entry point for clandestine adulteration. Uh, hey, we make our product better. We use higher quality ingredients. And that's why our men's virility product works in 90 minutes and not three months. It can be very hard to trace, inspect, and confirm. I've been on investigations in GMP facilities. And, uh, you know, I see a lot of issues sometimes even in the best facilities and if people are getting kludgy uh, obfuscation is pretty easy to to do but even good guys make mistakes you know we're humans you know sometimes we run a traffic light sometimes we back into a car it's not because we're desiring to do that it's because we're humans so we have to understand that things go wrong so here's an interesting clandestine adulteration study. Uh, consumer thought that there was something, a drug product in their, in their formula. They opened the capsule and found shell fragments inside the capsule. So we applied some phytoforensic tools, uh, FTR microspectroscopy and polarized light microscopy. And in addition to the shell, we found these interesting little crystals. And uh, with, with FTIR microscopy, we found that we had a couple PD5 inhibitor drugs in this all herbal mixture. So that was a, a very interesting thing where something got reprocessed, mixed down, but it still had the drug in it. So this is an interesting one too. All natural male enhancement formula, the capsules were empty, the powder was sent to the lab, it was clean, but consumer feedback suggested adulteration. And uh, what we found was really, really uh, brilliant from the, from the bad actor standpoint. The drug was actually entrained on the inside of the capsule wall under a layer. And so when you emptied the powder, there was nothing there. But when we started looking at the shell itself, the shell was impregnated with a pharmaceutical. Uh, simply brilliant, uh, uh, bad, bad guy stuff here, but, uh, you know, terrible for the company who thought they were doing due diligence. Then we have dendrobium, for those that remember this, uh, product was contaminated when, with in alpha diethylphenethylamine. Uh, there was arguments that dendrobium was a natural source of a PEA and that people were mistaking it with the beta isomer that was natural and it wasn't the alpha isomer and they co-elute by HPLC. Uh, so we got sample of material to authenticate and to help prove that this was the beta isomer. But we did a little extra investigation. And the first thing we noticed was how the surface fluoresced under UV 365. And you can see some fluorescing in the bag too. So this suggested to me that this dendrobium material had been sprayed with something. And when we ran the uh, GCMS, we found that we had a hit for enethyl, uh, diethyl phenethylamine. And we got both EI and CI uh, match spectra. And by GC mass spec, which we were using, you could separate these isomers. And because of the position of the side chain, they fragment in a different way. 
So we uh, conclusively determined that this pharmaceutical drug was present and it wasn't the beta isomer. There's some other uh, high profile racks that we investigated. One was the famous Nikki Haskell star caps. Unfortunately, GNC was one of the, the victims of this. It contained a loop diuretic called bumetanide. Starting dose is a half a milligram every two days. So this is a very potent drug and at very low levels, but we were able to determine that was present in there. A diuretic drug, uh, diuretics, laxatives, the, the anorectics, these all help people lose weight, and not that they're the best way to lose weight. And I presented this in the last um, presentation, investigating the Udream product, which ended up having an analog of Zopaclone. Um, so this stuff happens, and we trace that back to one of the ingredients coming from China that the Zappa clone had been added to. So you have to build trusting partners, but verify. This is how a lot of people think of analytical chemistry. You know, here's X. I got it solved. There it is. And anybody who's worked in a lab or worked on problems with the lab knows things are a lot more complicated. And uh, you can go down quite a rabbit hole in, in this work. So I want you to consider that even if all ingredients are tested, you still need to evaluate finished products and that contamination can enter the product during manufacturing in a variety of ways. Spot contamination can be missed during raw material testing. So testing the finished product again is invaluable to make sure that you don't have contaminants present. If you have a high risk product, you're selling sleep aids, men's virility, blood sugar support, performance enhancement. These are high risk categories and, and it, it is incumbent upon you to make sure your product is tested to document that it's not adulterated because I guarantee you if anybody fails a drug test and they're taking your product, they're gonna say, well, I was taking this product and you wanna have that data on hand to support that you've done your due diligence. So that's a really important thing. Pole manufacturers can be valuable partners in your efforts, but there can be some bad actors out there. And believe me, I've seen some really bad actors. I was involved in some cases that involved multiple consumer deaths. And so you need to really vet and you need to really pay attention to what's going on. And remember, you're ultimately responsible for your product. If you tell the FDA, well, I didn't know, I didn't understand, their position's gonna be, then you should have gotten somebody who does, or you shouldn't be in the business if you don't understand. Uh, if we went and got our, our blood pressure medication filled at the pharmacy and the pharmacist said, well, I think this is the right pill, but I'm not sure because I don't know a lot about it, I, I think we'd be a little bit irritated. So we owe our consumers and our industry because we're all in this together, we owe it to everyone to make sure we make the best products possible, we do the best science possible, and that we work together to solve problems. And uh, I think we've done a great job of that. When you look back on where we were and where we're now, I am so proud of the dietary supplements industry and of the scientists and the manufacturers who have risen to the challenge. I think we've done a great job. And I am really proud to be part of this industry. So I thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back to Larissa. Thank you, James, that was incredible. Who knew all of these amazing contamination and adulteration stories were even out there? So we appreciate you and all of your work. Um, pretty incredible to hear some of your examples. Even in my experience as a former FDA investigator, I don't think I have seen some of those case examples. So thank you very much for all of that. To everyone still on the call, um, we are um, two minutes until we finish the recording. So I just wanted to um, ask you all, I put in the chat window every um, speaker's email addresses. If we have any quick questions, can you go ahead and raise your hand or turn on your camera and we will allow you the floor and we'll see if we can address just a few of those. While we wait for that, just wanted to let you know that um, we have um, the recording that will be distributed as soon as possible. We hope that'll go out next week. You'll see that come out from Cura or Clint on our UNPA team. And um, we allow you to distribute that freely as you see fit. Um, I am not seeing any questions come up. I did have one um, that was in the chat bar to me. So I guess I'll go through that one that came in. 
Um, but the question was, um, are there, is there a, um, actually I have several. So is there a percent minimum on the non-active ingredients that need to be on the label? Do any of our panelists want to address that? Um, I sent my response in the chat that I said that typically when I was an investigator and looking at specification sheets, I would see a range that was included. Typically that was to allow for formulation. Um, when you're doing blending, you'll often see some sort of variation based on your sampling techniques as um, James mentioned, and also based on your analytical variability. But you wanna make sure when you're setting that range on your specification that that lower end of the range, um, that the regulation does require that you have 100% of label claim at the time of manufacturing and at the time of expiration. And if you work in operations, you know that's probably not quite the way that we do that as a standard, standard business operation, but that overage, when you say the high end of that range, you wanna make sure that's not gonna be um, a dangerous level for any of those nutrients that might be um, water soluble versus um, oil soluble that would might build up in the cell. So you wanna look at those, those, end, those two ends as your lower end being your 100% of label claim and at your high end, you're not gonna be in those toxic ranges. Um, next question. Um, I'm, I'm opening the floor to any of our presenters if they want to jump in on that. Do we have any? No. Um, then we have one more question. It is, is it required to have composition, basically the ingredient disclosure on the certificate of analysis for a dietary supplement? And my response is in my interpretation, yes. Um, and one thing I want to bring out to everyone included here, Katie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you in just a second, is when I was an investigator, we were looking at sub-ingredients, typically because they might be allergens. And we see a lot of allergen recalls um, related to not evaluating your sub-ingredients. So that's kind of the mindset that the investigator has when they're looking at um, these ingredient declarations. Katie, can you add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and it's better to know uh, the composition than not know. So uh, as manufacturers, you, you really have to take a look at your ingredient composition and make sure that there are no uh, items that could potentially cause uh, any allergy uh, in, in the consumer. But also uh, when it comes to the amounts, and I, I think there was a question even prior to, um, to the webinar that came from, um, I think, Linda sent, sent an email over. Uh, th there was a question about uh, processing aids or excipients and the numerical value that needs to or doesn't need to be included in, in the specification or label. So uh, basically, if it's present there in substantial amounts, it needs to be listed. If it's uh, what we go by, if it's less than 1% in the ingredient, it doesn't have to be listed on the label unless it introduces a potential of, of, of an allergen being uh, manufactured into the finished good. Perfect. Thanks, Katie. And Alejandra, I see you have your camera on. Did you have a question? And if so, you would be our last? No? Nope. All right. Well, anyone um, still on the call, I appreciate your time and your effort. I hope this helped you to understand finished product specifications. I wanna thank all of our speakers, you are amazing. Elon with Alchemist Kit from um, USP, Jason Eurofins, Katie with Now Foods, and James with Flora Research. You all are amazing and we really appreciate you and your time. So everyone else out there, thank you. Have thank a fantastic you. day and we wish you well. Thank you. Thanks everyone.